Okay. I'm just going to find my PowerPoint here, that one. And start her up here. Hopefully. There we go. So you guys have full screen right now? Yes. All right. Perfect. So uh, I was just say about 50 slides in this presentation, uh, part A of sample systems. We walk you through uh, all the basic stuff uh, really with sample systems, inter introduction to sample systems 101, I guess, basically. Uh, this will probably give you some information on things that you're already known, known about, um, but give you, you know, some uh, deeper understanding of, of the things that uh, go on in designing a sample handling system, installing the sample handling system, and maintaining the sample handling system. So first slide here, a uh, quick picture of a, a fairly elaborate yet simple uh, sample system here. Um, this is all contained within a, a little cabinet. And when you, when you have a, a, an arrangement like this where you have all the different uh, conditioning components mounted in a, in a cabinet, they call it a sample conditioning unit. Uh, and the idea of, of the name sample conditioning unit uh, in reference to a sample system is that it's the part of the sample system that prepares uh, the sample in some way to make it acceptable uh, for the analyzer. The analyzers that uh, are often uh, supplied through the sample handling systems have very specific requirements in terms of temperatures and pressures and cleanliness of the sample, uh, phases of the sample, be it liquid or gas, uh, the amount of solids that can, it can tolerate, uh, things of that nature. So the sample handling system uh, starts, starts at the process uh, where the sample is drawn and then of course uh, ends when we discard uh, the sampled material. So we're going to take some time today and look at all the individual uh, components and some of the uh, theory behind sample handling uh, systems. So here's just some pictures uh, of some sample handling systems. This one's rather elaborate. I, I throw this one in here because this is uh, one of the jobs that I did uh, out at Nova uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, nice job. Uh, kept me busy for a long time. Um, make me question the idea behind designing an analyzer that has a circular header. Uh, it was an interesting uh, interesting job to do, but you can see uh, just between these two slides, relatively simple to, to things that are relatively complicated. All of these lines, of course, go through uh, rotometers and, and other conditioning elements, regulators and things of that nature. Um, but just to illustrate that uh, some sample systems are simple and some of them are a little bit nasty. So there's another, uh, another view of this sample handling system, which was on a on a furnace out at a chemical plant, uh, not far from Red here. So uh, just flexing a little bit, showing you that I don't just talk, I can actually do some work and not too bad at it if I have to say so myself. All right, uh, yeah, flex, 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 very good. Okay, uh, outcomes of this uh, ILM, uh, explain the analyzer sampling systems, components and material specifications. Uh, describe the purpose of a sample handling system, which I have already done that for you. Uh, define in situ and extractive, extractive sampling, so we'll get into that for a few pages. Uh, the purpose and methods of sample conditioning, kind of touched on that already. And then we'll define uh, specifically clean and dirty service uh, systems. Okay, so what is the purpose of a sample handling system? We kind of identify that as, the, as getting the sample from the process to the analyzer. Um, but it's a little bit more than that. Uh, sample system is that equipment that is required to transport and condition a process sample. So not only is it getting it from the process to the analyzer, but it is also a major, uh, a major component of, of a sample system is to condition the process sample to make it acceptable again for the analyzer. So it includes um, all the tubing, valves, regulators, heaters, pumps, probes, and any other hardware that may be necessary. Um, the sample handling system is separate from, but included in an analyzer system. So if we talk about an analyzer system, of course, it is going to include 
uh, the analyzer and, and all the associated hardware, which would be the sample handling system. Um, but the sample hand handling system is an independent component, I guess, inside the analyzer system. Not that that's really that significant. <clears throat> okay, another uh, simple version of a sample handling system here. A uh, gas detector or something like that, an uh, oxygen detector, this one here looks like. And some basic components, uh, we'll talk about pretty much all of these here. Uh, check valve possibly or a filter down here. Uh, pressure regulator here, some type of a flow conditioning device here. And then the presentation area here where we have the, the flow in and coming, coming out again. So this would be uh, what we call a continuous uh, analyzer because it is... Uh, having flow pulled from the process, going through some type of a pressure reduction area here, which creates a differential, which encourages the flow, and then returns it back into the uh, process. Uh, this is an ideal situation, uh, of course, where you can pull a sample, uh, analyze it, and then put it back into the process. You don't lose anything. Uh, you're not wasting anything, but quite often, this is not the way uh, that it's always done, but it is ideal. Okay, all the goodies here. So pressure control, flow control, check valves, filters, all kinds of goodies uh, inside the sample handling system. <clears throat> okay, function of the sample handling system. Uh, it really does five uh, functions uh, continuously and automatically. Uh, it'll extract the sample from the process stream, transport the sample, condition the sample, provide some facility for calibration, and then dealing with the waste products after analyzing. So we can look at this in uh, a block diagram. I, I warned you earlier that block diagrams are big in third year and will continue to be so in fourth year. So good to be able to wrap your head around the idea of a block diagram here. And this is a, a block diagram showing you exactly what we had in the previous system where the sample uh, gets pulled out of the process, gets sent away, through the sample conditioning system to the analyzer, out of the analyzer to be managed in terms of waste. And then somewhere here on the side of the analyzer, we've got uh, some type of a mechanism where we can calibrate it. So uh, we'll talk about different ways of getting the process out of the pipe. This one here uh, is called a fa uh, fast loop bypass, but we'll define uh, a few different ways of getting the sample out of the system. But uh, everything that we see in this slide here is represented uh, in a block diagram in this slide. Quick little bitty here on sample taps um, and where we get our sample from. And it's important to consider. Uh, some processes, processes are uh, well mixed, some processes are not well mixed, some are liquids, some are gases, et cetera, et cetera. So where we pull our sample uh, from uh, varies by application, I guess, and without getting into too much detail because we, we do talk about this again later in the ILM. Ideally, uh, the big thing you want to get is a proper representation of what's going on inside the process. Uh, and as a general rule, um, it's, it's stated as picking the center third of the pipe. Uh, and the reason being the center third of the pipe here is that hopefully everything is uh, mixed up well enough uh, and gives us the most representative uh, sample of what's going on inside the cross-section of, of the pipe itself. Different ways to get there, as you see on the left-hand side here, we have a little packing gland with a sample probe that can be raised and, and lowered. Uh, lots of times these will have indicators on them telling us uh, how deep uh, to, to penetrate into the process so that we can get into that uh, kind of sweet spot there. But we'll talk more. Uh, about sample taps later on in the ILM. Okay, typically also uh, what type of a, a sample it is, uh, gas or liquids, uh, has some impact on, on where we put our probe. So generally, uh, if we're going to sample a gas, we take it off the top, that leaves all the liquids in the bottom of the pipe. And if we're going to uh, measure uh, or sample a liquid, we're probably going to take it off the side of the pipe, leaving the gases up here at the top and any solids that may be in the in the flow down here at the bottom. So uh, this was a couple of pages that were separated from the other section on sample taps, which is a few pages down into the ILM. We 
probably could be moved, but uh, I like to address the island in, in the flow that it goes. Uh, sample transport. Here we'll spend a little bit of time talking about different methods uh, for sample transport. So uh, we define them in the ILM um, as three different types. Uh, the first one is a single line transport system, which is pretty straightforward. It's a, it's a tap in the process, uh, throttle that valve, whatever assembly uh, tapped into the process, and some tubing uh, that comes straight out of the process to the analyzer. The analyzer does, it work, does its work and then gets rid of the waste uh, to a vent or drain somewhere. <clears throat> this is the simplest version. Uh, the second type is called a bypass stream, where we have uh, a larger pipe here. This would be, let's say, uh, if this was a six or eight inch process pipe, this might be a one or two inch uh, pipe, uh, which is called a bypass stream. So it's got higher flow. And the, and the reason behind that is if we get more flow, it's, it's faster to get to the analyzer. So we bring it to the analyzer faster in, in a little bit bigger pipe. And then once we're closer to the analyzer, we can uh, we can tee off that smaller pipe with some tubing and bring it to the analyzer. And we'll talk specifically about uh, the benefits uh, of using this method over a single line transport. And the, the short story is that it's uh, it's generally faster. The last type uh, here is called a bypass return uh, fast loop. And this was uh, similar to the previous example that we had there. And it's, uh, it's similar, similar to this one here where uh, the piping that comes off the process is a little bit larger. Uh, the idea here is that you get a better, uh, you get a better sample if we can uh, just make a little bypass here on the side of the pipe. And this is uh, really in the area where you're standing. So it's not going to be 40 feet of pipe or anything like that. It's going to come out a couple of feet with some one inch pipe or inch and a half pipe or something like that. Uh, come across and then go right back. Uh, into the system. Usually there's some type of a, a differential or a restriction here uh, that's going to encourage the flow uh, this way. But again, it, it achieves the same benefit here of, of getting a more representative sample because the just the uh, sampling portion of it physically is larger, but it also um, provides faster flow, um, which pushes it towards the analyzer a little bit faster. So those are the three general sample transport types that we identify in uh, this ILM. <clears throat> okay, sample conditioning. Uh, again, sample conditioning, making the sample suitable uh, for the process. So this conditioning is in light of the critical importance of delivering a representative sample. And this is, uh, aside from safety, uh, getting the sample uh, out safely and analyzing it safely, the second largest consideration, depending on who you ask, uh, but second largest consideration is making sure that that sample is representative uh, of the process. It's no good uh, to us if by the time we get it to the analyzer, it's no longer uh, the same as it was uh, when we pulled it out of the process. If, uh, if the solids drop out of it or the uh, gases condense into a liquid or the liquids vaporize into a gas or something like that, it's not going to be any good to us. It's got to be pretty close to the same when we analyze it as it is sitting in the piping. So in some cases, uh, we need to condition it uh, in order so that that analyzer will function uh, reliably and with minimal maintenance and analytical problems. So long story short, the sample has to be compatible or suitable for the analyzer. Okay, conditioning is sometimes required by the physical parameters in the analyzer, such as uh, the tolerance that the sensor has for temperature or for particles or for pressure. Uh, and there's different, uh, different uh, sensors out there uh, that have different constraints, and we have to be aware uh, when we design the system. <clears throat> okay, the calibration facility, one of the five uh, functions of the sample handling system is to provide uh, some way for us to integrate uh, integrate calibration into it. So the calibration facility, fancy word for uh, a means of introducing calibration gases to the analyzer. So usually achieved uh, using a multi-port valve that we can switch the analyzer offline with uh, and integ integrate or introduce the zero gas and the span gas. So if we got a four-way valve, normal operation, we have it turned this way. So the process sample goes to the analyzer 
And then by turning the, the valve this way or that way, we can introduce the zero gas or the span gas. So this is usually introduced um, after all the sample system hardware, but before uh, the analyzer. Okay, once we do the analysis, uh, we have to get rid of the, the stuff that we analyzed. So ideally, uh, we want to return it back to the process so we don't, we don't A, lose profits, and B, we don't have to process it again, uh, and, and C, it's not an environmental concern in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but that's not always possible and not always common. Uh, for example, it's pretty hard to, um, or not really feasible to return a gas sample from a well site out in the middle of the boondocks uh, back to the well. Uh, so we flare. So uh, there's different methods of doing it, whether it's uh, flaring it uh, or collecting it and processing it in a separate system. Uh, for example, you can have a separate sewer system in the chemical plants uh, around Red Deer, for example, have their own water treatment facilities. Uh, so anything that ends up going on, on the ground uh, within the plant isn't uh, sent into the system without being processed in some way. So whether we return it to the process, flare it, or process it, we do have to deal with it somewhere, somehow. <coughs> okay, another uh, function of the sample handling system, uh, or if they, uh, you want to believe what they say, the most important aspect of the sample handling system is that it can deliver a sample to be analyzed safely. Uh, lots of the samples that we deal with uh, can be dangerous, uh, toxic, uh, at its worst uh, case scenario, but also in terms of temperature, pressure, uh, hazardous or corrosive samples. Uh, so we have to be uh, aware of the safety concerns. So uh, second, uh, again, to safety is that representative, uh, representative sample. So safety first. Representative sample second, uh, of course, depending on who you ask. Okay, 80% of all analyzer problems are associated with the sample handling system. This is a fact. This has been preached in every material package since I was a young apprentice. Uh, this was a fact then. It's still a fact now. Um, most of the issues you are going to have with a sample system or an analyzer system occur before uh, the sample even gets to the sensor. So 80% of the problems are with the sample handling and conditioning system. Okay, so to deal with uh, these, uh, you know, safety conditions and representative sample situations, we have to uh, make the analyzer uh, system and sample system specifically designed for that particular application. So they're all custom designed to the specific applications and they have to be designed, fabricated, installed, and commissioned uh, to suit that particular application. Again, 80% of all analyzer problems are associated with that sample handling system and making sure that we're aware of all the different requirements allows us to get all of these custom features done effectively and properly the first time around, hopefully. Okay, moving to objective two, uh, defining in situ and extractive sampling. And this is pretty straightforward. In situ or inline sampling involves the sensor being in direct contact with the process. In direct contact with the process, pretty much indirect contract, not quite, but pretty much, but this is indirect contact with the process. So in situ or in line, a couple words that are interchangeable that describes situation A. Extractive sampling, uh, these systems continuously remove a small representative sample from the process stream and transport it to the sensor. The sensor may be near or far. So here the sample is extracted from the process, the sensor is near, and we call this at line. So not in the line or in situ, but at the line. Okay, so this is kind of like our fast loop bypass. And then the second one farther away, again, we take 
uh, with this also bypass loop. Um, but we take that bypass loop and then some tubing and we transport it some distance to get to the sensor. So these two are extractive because they're pulling the sample out of the actual process. This one uh, in situ or in line uh, because the sensor is in uh, the process. Oh, you guys aren't even seeing that picture yet. Here's the picture. Sorry about that. Okay, again, in situ or in line is self-descriptive. It is in situ or in line. These ones here are considered to be extractive. Pulled the sample out, sent it to a sensor, and then back into the process here in the fast loop style. Uh, same one here, uh, distance from line, so fast loop still, but again, bringing that sample out of the process to the sensor. Okay, uh, talking about specifically now in situ here, uh, again, probe directly mounted in the process. Benefits of this, there are no, no sample transfer lines, so you're not gonna get plugage. Uh, it's gonna be cheaper. Uh, it's going to be faster because the sensor, of course, is right there. As soon as the process change, it's measured, uh, and the sensor can respond. Downside, uh, the sensor's got to be pretty rugged. It's mounted in the field in the process piping, so it's got to be uh, suitable for that particular environment. We talked about environments earlier, uh, temperature, uh, weather, you know, vibrations, all these kind of things. So uh, these in situ... Uh, ones have to be a little bit more more rugged. Uh, in, situ, uh, in situ also maybe point sensors or path sensors and we'll talk more about path sensors uh, when we get into combustion because uh, combustion CO particularly uh, uses a path sensor. Uh, I'll just quickly define a path sensor here. Basically transmitter on one side, uh, receiver on the other side, sample in the middle uh, and we use some type of a uh, energy, in this case infrared light, shine it at the sample, the sample absorbs some of the light, uh, some of the light makes it through to the detector and we measure that difference, yada yada. Uh, point detector, of course, uh, very simple and straightforward, we put it in the process, it measures uh, at that point. <clears throat> okay, extractive sampling again, either at line or distance, we saw the example here, um, at line, very close to the process, disadvantages, uh, and advantages for both these systems and, uh, you know, a little bit different between the two of them due to that distance, um, but they have benefits and advantages. Again, uh, the advantages here, they can be conditioned, uh, and that's important, especially if it needs to be conditioned. Uh, easier maintenance, um, comparing it to uh, in situ here, if we have a problem and we need to pull this, uh, we got to stop flow some, somehow here on the process, and that's you know, not ideal in certain situations. Uh, there's ways to get around that in this area here, but this is a good example of uh, no provision for being able to remove this with the process running. Um, so extractive sampling makes that a little bit easier. Uh, I guess to that same end here, in a real world situation, there would be a valve uh, here and a valve here to allow removal of this uh, sensor. Um, but that's the way she goes. That's kind of what has to be there in order to make this easier maintenance happen. Uh, it's just something that's not shown in the diagram, and I guess that's my bad. Disadvantages, uh, of course, this introduces lag time because we're not in the process anymore and we have to transport at some distance. So again, depending on uh, the piping scheme, uh, whether it's a fast loop bypass uh, or if it's half inch tubing, that's gonna affect the speed that that sample gets from A to B. Uh, and it also affects possibly uh, the representativity, if that's a word, uh, of that sample. Uh, sample taps. I told you we'd be back at sample taps here again. Uh, we'll define it now since we've already talked about it, but a sample, sample tap. Finish the side of the pipe to allow sampling from the process stream. Uh, generally used on small diameter pipe, but that's not always true. Um, and they're all similar but different, uh, but you know, common common features here, hole in the pipe. Um, on the outside here, depending on your system, may or may not have a probe, may or may not have packing glands, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But sample tap is, is some type of a hole in the pipe that we draw our sample from. Said earlier that we had talked more about sample taps. 
Uh, here we talk about liquids and gases one more time. Um, these are the conditions. So here we have a gas uh, throwing, flowing through a pipe that may have some solids or liquids in it. The idea here, we take the R sample off the top because we're expecting it to be mostly gas. And as such, this allows for all the non-gas items to be at the bottom. <clears throat> liquids, uh, interesting uh, change, I guess, uh, logically here. We take it off the side. Um, again, same logic. Uh, we're expecting the gases to be at the top of the pipe, solids to be at the bottom of the pipe. Uh, and ideally, the majority of this diagram should be a, a liquid. And most pipes, of course, are going to be more full than this, obviously. So taking it off the side uh, is, is a reasonable expectation. Uh, lots of people will say, well, why don't you take it off the bottom? Um, and you may see that. You may see it coming off the bottom. Uh, the downside, of course, to coming off the bottom is if there's, uh, you know, solids in here, uh, flake, scale, rust, anything that we're not wanting to analyze, uh, considering that we're probably sending this to a liquid analyzer, that's going to be something that has to be dealt with and that's going to cause maintenance issues. So as a general rule, uh, liquids off the side because we're assuming that the pipes are going to be full. We don't always have just a tap in the side of the pipe and a valve and we, and we take the take the flow straight out of it. Sometimes we use sample probes. Uh, many different kinds of sample probes um, identified in the ILM, um, but we'll talk about uh, just, a, just a few of them here. Uh, where sample taps are used on smaller pipes, we use sample probes on larger ones, uh, larger ones so that we can get a sample from the center of the pipe where the process is mixed better. And we talked about uh, mixing earlier when we want to be in that sweet spot in the center third of the pipe. So let's imagine that this, instead of being a, a, you know, a four, six, eight inch pipe, this is a, a 24, 36, 48 inch pipe, so a, a bigger pipe. Um, and as, as such, we get less, uh, less mixing going on in it because the flow is generally not as vigorous. So we want to make sure that we're getting a, a good mixed sample. Um, different types of probes, I'm not going to specifically discuss uh, all of them that are mentioned in the ILM, but they, they are all designed for a uh, specific purpose. Now uh, this one here, for example, has a 45 degree angled cut. And the benefit to having this 45 degree angled cut is if I have some uh, suspended solids in my gas flow, for example, those solids are gonna come, come by here, hit on the probe. That's gonna create a low pressure uh, area on the other side of the probe here, which is gonna have a tendency to make the solids drop out and then the, uh, the gases will be able to go back out the pipe. So uh, same idea here uh, with the angled probe, um, the isokinetic energy of the gas flowing by creates a slightly lower, uh, a slightly lower uh, pressure after the high pressure area that's created as it hits the probe, and that allows the solids to kind of drop out and the gas uh, with a higher, higher velocity can uh, go up into the probe. So I'm not going to get into too many details. <clears throat> Variety of probe types from the free, previous single port types to multi-port, uh, multi-point, uh, multi-story port probes that'll grab uh, an average sample across the diameter of the pipe uh, to also isokinetic probes. In the next slide, I'll talk about isokinetic probes. Um, but to put into perspective here, what is a multi-port probe? Pretty self-explanatory. Um, Used for measuring airflow, typically uh, combustion turbines, gas turbines, things like that. We'll have uh, airflow measurements where uh, a probe will go all the way across the cross section of the pipe, but we'll have several holes in it uh, in order to measure different areas within that cross section. And that's what a multi port uh, probe kind of does. Um, and you can read up on it in the ILM specifics. Okay, isokinetic probe, I've mentioned. Um, specifically in this one, uh, it deals with uh, solids um, in a gas typically. Um, and we want to keep these solids out of the gas sample uh, most of the time, but sometimes we want to measure some of the solids in a gas sample. Uh, common examples are uh, coal-fired plants, for example, uh, things that burn uh, solid fuels, uh, trash dumps, things like that. We're, we're sending our stack gas up 
up the stack after we burn garbage or after we burn coal. We know that there's particles going up there and we have to report this to the government. So we want to have a sample that has some representation of these particles in the flow. And the application that is used for that is an isokinetic probe. Um, and what these do is they sit in the process. I don't know if I, is there another picture? No. They sit in the process with the opening of the probe facing directly uh, into the flow. And the idea is that it's catching those particles that are mixed in that uh, sample. It's catching them and giving a, an equal uh, representation to uh, the analyzer uh, somewhere, somewhere upstream. K installation, uh, again, just just touching on some of the things that you may or may not may or may not may not see. Uh, of course, a probe of some specific design may, may or may not change. Uh, usually, a valve, if you're lucky, uh, some kind of a warning tag saying, "Hey, this line's under pressure. Uh, once you undo this packing gland, this thing could shoot out and hit you in the nose." Um, packing gland depth mark, uh, some tubing, uh, an orientation marker, not only for depth. Um, but also uh, for direction. So once you stuff this into the into the pipe here, you don't really know where this angle uh, is anymore. So there will be a reference mark saying, you know, point this mark upstream or point this mark downstream, so that you're insured to get this angle uh, perpendicular to the flow. <clears throat> At line extraction. So these are all these are all things that uh, we're dealing with uh, in line. And this is now at line. So, following features of at line uh, quick transport, rapid response, easier maintenance. Uh, at line, uh, the indicator here, of course, is a sensor which is located in a local bypass flow loop near the process line. So, different ways to do this. Uh, this one here is uh, an adducted style flow where we're promoting a draft by uh, shooting air in there. Long story short, I'll let you read about that. But at line, not in the line, but relatively close to the line. Um, yeah, um, not as fast as, of course, in the line, but faster than transporting at some distance. Okay, objective three um, defining uh, and describing the purpose and methods of sample conditioning. So, this is uh, really largely hardware based. Uh, so, looking at the different types of hardware. Uh, that are between the process tap and the analyzer itself. Okay, so sample conditioning system is what we call uh, this collection of goodies here. Get us all this up here. So we put it all inside a cabinet together like this, and we call this a sample conditioning unit. Um, otherwise, it's part of the sample conditioning system. And its purpose, of course, is providing all the mechanical hardware to collect a representative sample, condition it to the analyzer specifications, transport it to the analyzer, and then handle any waste material after analysis safely. Okay, it may include, but is definitely not limited to flow control, temperature control, pressure control, um, phase conversion, so liquids to gases, gases to liquids, so this could involve uh, heating a gas to a vapor, so that would require a heater or condensing a gas to a liquid, uh, which would uh, require a chiller, uh, all kinds of interesting goodies. So we'll talk about some of the more common ones. First one is pressure. Uh, pressure controlled by regulators uh, with down, uh, downstream gauges for reading. Uh, also pressure relief valves are in, uh, also installed in these systems uh, in case of regulator failure, so both devices uh, for controlling pressure uh, in uh, normal and abnormal circumstances. Flow rate, uh, hardware associated with flow rate, typically needle valves, uh, rotometers. Uh, these are typically things that we use. Uh, check valves in terms of safety equipment uh, to prevent backflow uh, and also personnel and equipment. Temperature. Uh, of course, uh, getting the sample to the right temperature for the analyzer sensor is important. So making hot samples cool and cool samples hot as required. Um, we heat gas samples to keep them from condensing. 
Uh, we heat liquid samples to vaporize them for faster transport. So uh, different hardware in there for different conditions. Uh, temperature must be above the dew point where the sample might condense in the line, and we don't want that. Uh, we'll talk uh, a little bit later in this ILM uh, about the effects of having uh, liquid or solid components in a gas sample uh, or gas components in a liquid sample and how that affects our, our measurement, right? We're expecting to see a certain percentage of, uh, of this in a gas, uh, 100 milliliters of gas, but if 50 milliliters of that gas is actually water, well, then we've got a much higher concentration because we've got X percent of what we're looking for in 60 millimeters or 60 milliliters of uh, a gas um, because 40 milliliters of it is actually water. So we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, phase changes and phase condition uh, process streams uh, may contain one uh, or all phases of a sample, so solid liquid gas. Um, most analyzers, <clears throat> unfortunately, prefer to have the sample in a single phase. Um, we want to make sure that it's the right phase. Um, removing solids is also a big concern. Um, again, 80% of sample handling systems are in the, uh, or 80% 80, 80 of analyzer systems are in the sample system, and I would say that 80% of those problems are caused by plugging. Uh, so removing solids is a big concern. And because there's such a major concern, we're going to talk uh, a little bit uh, specifically about removing solids here. Uh, three types of filtering that we mentioned in the ILM. Uh, wire mesh filters, which are wire mesh exactly like you would think. Uh, guard filters, which are specific to uh, protecting the instruments. And then some self-cleaning versions, self-cleaning bypass, bypass filters. And, we, and there's a couple types uh, mentioned in the ILM, the cylindrical type, which is kind of like a uh, oil filter or air cleaner. And then a swirl uh, type, which is a little bit more dynamic. <clears throat> filter material is uh, usually mesh for coarse removal and sintered steel uh, for finer debris. But there are many, again, different types of filters out there. Uh, and you'll read about several of them in the ILM. Uh, and they'll all come with some kind of a specification uh, indicating the size of particle that uh, the analyzer is meant to tolerate. Uh, and thereby, we got to make sure that we uh, select an appropriate filter, uh, usually in some type of microns, you know, 100 microns or 2 microns. Um, and the filter is contained in some kind of a housing. And we want to know what the volume of that housing um, and we'll talk about that in the next ILM. But all of these components and the volume that they introduce into the sample handling, handling system uh, will reduce the, or will increase the amount of time it takes for the sample to get from the process to the analyzer because we've got to fill all of these volumes. So it's not just tubing that's got to be filled uh, before you, know, you, you crack the valve on the process. The tubing starts filling with the process. And it takes a certain amount of time to fill all the tubing with the process. And then once that tubing is full, then it hits the analyzer. Well, the more stuff we introduce in between the process and the analyzer uh, is volume. And it takes more time to fill that volume. So that leads in something called transport lag time, which we'll talk about in the next ILM. But keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay, so removing solids. Uh, important that you're pretty fresh on uh, these different types of uh, filters. Removing liquids uh, from gases. <clears throat> For large droplets in a sample, we use a piece of equipment called a knockout pot uh, to remove most liquids. Uh, and I, I guess I should have put a diagram here of a knockout pot, but basically uh, what a knockout pot is, is uh, it's a pot. It's a circular vessel, and you've probably all seen them. A uh, 10-inch piece of pipe, for example, with two caps welded on it. Uh, you feed the gas in the top, and you have a drain on the bottom, and then you take the dry gas also at the top. So the idea is you, you, you feed it with some gas that might have liquid in it. Uh, it comes into the vessel. The liquids, by gravity, will want to fall down to the bottom. And the gases will stay at the top. So we can pass the gas basically straight through and drain the liquids up the bottom. And that's what a knockout pot does. And we'll talk about knockout pots uh, when we do uh, differential pressure level. Uh, same piece of equipment, except, except it's got a different name. Okay, for smaller droplets like mists, 
we'll use a coalescing filter. And what a coalescing filter does is it just makes the drops uh, all join up together and drop out. And you probably have one of these on your garage air compressor. Uh, and I think I show a picture. I think I show a picture. Oh, maybe I don't. Um, but there are pictures in the ILM. So major water knockout pot, minor water coalescing filter. Um, gas analyzers like dry samples. Remember, if there's water in it, it'll affect the reading by changing the volume ratio of the sample, right? We're expecting to take, uh, we're looking for a certain component in a gas, in a 100% gas mixture, right? If that 100% gas mixture is 100 cubic centimeters, and we're looking, you know, the analyzer is going to get 1% out of that, so it's looking for one cubic centimeter out of 100. Uh, if for some reason our gas sample is 40% water, well, then suddenly that one cubic centimeter of analyte that we're looking for is compressed into 60 cubic centimeters of gas. It's suddenly a lot more concentrated than it really is. So that's why water and solids removal is so very important. Okay, two methods of removing water, um, refrigerated condensers and permeation dryers. So let's look at those. Here's a refrigerated condenser. Uh, again, basically a condenser's job is just to cool the sample and make the water drop out. Uh, if you're into moonshine, uh, there you go. Uh, you provide the, your sample uh, through here and as it goes through here, it cools. As it cools, it condenses and then we can drain it out again. <clears throat> And uh, plastic water permeable, permeable tubes here um, used in a permeation dryer. So a permeation dryer is kind of the opposite of a coalescing filter. Uh, the idea, uh, oh, actually, it's, it's pretty similar, actually, to a coalescing filter. The idea is that droplets form on it, collect, uh, and then once there's enough of a mass of them, uh, they can be drained out. OK, removing gas from a gas. Uh, it's not something that you typically think about, uh, but some gas samples will contain interference gases, and we identified interference gases, uh, gases as those things in the sample that we don't want to measure. Um, these gases can also be corrosive and damaging to the analyzer, so we need to get them out of there. Two methods uh, are, are ad absorbers, absorbers here, which uh, facilitate a chemical reaction. Uh, in order to remove the unwanted material. Uh, here is a sparger, and basically it's just through bubbles and reaction between the gases in the, in the sample. Uh, they bond up to the bubbles and, and so on and so forth. So a couple of methods to remove gases from gases, uh, absorbers and spargers. Okay, a little more on conditioning here. I guess general information. Uh, analyzers are fussy. Um, we've seen that the sample can't be too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, too dirty, or uh, too high a pressure or flow rate. So it is the responsibility of the sample conditioning unit or sample system to ensure that all of these needs are met so we don't damage the analyzer and we maintain a representative sample. That's the end game. All right, objective four. Um, a lot of information in objective four about clean and dirty service systems, um, but really it's pretty basic. Uh, deals more with specific applications. Uh, I dropped a graphic in here just to keep your brain wrapped around the fact that most of the time when we're dealing with a dirty service system, that is uh, a gas flow that has particulate in it. These are typically some type of a solid fuel burning uh, system, whether it's coal or wood or garbage, whatever it is, when we burn it, there's going to be some particulates. Uh, and really that's the definition of a dirty service. But let's, let's have a look and see here. Okay, in analyzer systems, clean or dirty refers to the amount O particles in the sample the amount of particles in the sample. Clean has low levels, while dirty has high levels. It comes down to that, okay? Um, what is considered clean and dirty? 
doesn't really elaborate that much in the ILM, but it does define the fact that clean natural gas uh, is defined as having no particles larger than one micron and less than one milligram of solids per cubic meter. So there are specifications. Okay, dirty services include stack gas analysis and flue gas analysis. Again, I said usually things related to something being burnt. <clears throat> when we burn coal, those particles are fly ash uh, and part of the flue emissions. Um, we want these gone usually before they get up the stack, but there are always some remaining. Um, governments want to know about that, environmentalists want to know about that, so we have to measure it. Um, other industries such as cement, pulp, paper, steel, uh, minerals and waste disposal, uh, disposal will use kilns uh, to burn off some of their garbage, uh, which also give off particles. So to deal with these uh, problems related to these particles, we have special probes to handle uh, dirty service. And we'll talk about dirty service probes uh, quite a bit here. <clears throat> okay, there's a perfect example of a dirty service stack system. Uh, color comes from particles. So whether it's rolling coal or burning plastic, um, that's particles and those are considered to be dirty service. Uh, stack gas, a uh, particular application that we're concerned with here, uh, um, has some characteristics such as being hot, uh, containing particles, and also containing water vapor. So common sense uh, tells us that particles and moisture don't generally go together well. Um, and this can have an influence, of course, on our sampling, uh, especially maintenance issues uh, dealing with plugging. So we have obviously special ways to deal with that. So two specific types of stack analyzers here, uh, dealing with specific types of stack gases. The first one is called hot and wet, um, which means uh, the, the gas is hot and wet. And this is typical with uh, combustion gases. And what we have to make sure is that if we have a hot and wet, uh, hot and wet process, we want the sample to remain uh, hot or the wetness will condense and that will cause issues. The second thing we have to uh, be aware of in, in terms of specific uh, sample processes are, are cool and dry. Uh, and again, these have the requirement of being uh, dry by the time they get to the analyzer. So we have to make sure that we can uh, maintain these conditions for uh, the stack analysis. Okay, so different probes. To extract dirty gas, we have a couple of options. Uh, we filter and then extract uh, using a filter probe, or we filter and dilute it using a dilution probe. And there's a photo page of write up, I think, on each one of these. Uh, one of these probes. Um, the second one's a little bit more complicated than the first one. The first one is actually quite simple. Um, and I think, uh, I think we will look at them both. Okay, filter probe uh, is typically used for applications that have lots of dust, um, whereas the, the dilution probe or dilution extractive probe um, is a little bit different. It uses a clean, dry gas as a carrier gas. <laughs> Uh, to lower the dew point temperature so that we don't have to, uh, so that we don't have to heat trace it. Basically, we're diluting the amount of moisture in it so that it can condense as it is transported. Uh, let's look at these here probes. There's a filter probe, uh, pretty simple. Um, as the name implies, uh, this probe has a, a filter, in this case, a sintered steel or porous ceramic filter, um, and it's protected um, from larger direct uh, debris by deflector de uh, deflector plate which directs the particles past the filter housing relatively straightforward i mean we're like uh, a plate here really and most of the particles are blasted off to the side again uh, creates a high pressure area as it hits this piece of steel which increases the velocity and forces the heavier things this way and then there's a low pressure area created on this side and the less dense materials uh, have the ability to curl up and over and get sampled here. Uh, anything that's remaining is caught 
in this filter. Uh, again, a centered steel filter uh, or ceramic filter. Uh, centered steel always has fascinated me. I always talk about it, although there is no requirement for it. But centered steel, and you've probably seen it, and if you haven't really understood it, it's just a bunch of uh, little teeny steel balls uh, that are pressed together. So now, if you think of some of the hardware that you've probably played with, you've probably played with a, a centered steel filter before, but uh, very, very common nonetheless. Uh, dilution probe, uh, as we see here, a little bit more complicated, uh, but the major uh, thing that identifies as a, uh, as a dilution probe is the introduction of air uh, coming in here. And you can think of it as a carrier gas. We, we put some air into here, you see it comes flowing in, goes into this pressure chamber. Also connected to the pressure chamber here uh, is uh, an inlet for our uh, sample gas to come in. Okay, so that comes in here as well. And as we uh, flow our carrier gas through here, it creates a venturi uh, that causes a draw on our sample gas, dilutes the two of them in here, and then sends out a diluted mixture uh, to the analyzer, which hopefully now has less moisture in it and therefore it won't condense. So uh, that's the simple explanation of it. Um, the ILM does explain it probably in a little bit more detail, but that's, uh, that's uh, down and dirty of, uh, of a dilution probe. Okay, flue gas uh, systems again here showing our, our wonderful uh, combustion example here. And this is a great example to start getting used to because we do, uh, talk about uh, gas analyzers uh, in third year as a subject. So that is largely uh, combustion and burner management. Flue gas is monitored to ensure burner efficiency and performance. We measure oxygen and carbon monoxide as indicators of that performance. And uh, we'll have a, sec or a section on that uh, later on. <clears throat> Again, you'll see all these uh, wonderful things here. Sample conditioning here, sample conditioning here. Uh, we got in situ uh, carbon monoxide uh, path analyzer going on here. Uh, we have an extractive uh, distant style uh, CO monitor here. Uh, we've got an inline or outline oxygen analyzer. So all different uh, stuff in here. Next slide. Uh, talks a little bit more specifically, although still rather generally about uh, the wet or dry gas sample and the effects of having uh, having things in your sample that aren't supposed to be there. For example, moisture in a gas sample or solids in a gas sample and the effect of uh, how it changes the, the ratio between what you're looking for and and the whole uh, the whole component that we pulled from the pipe. Okay, so uh, measurements again on a wet sample are different than on a dry sample. The water component effectively dilutes the sample reading. Um, and again, it'll make more sense for you to read it yourself. I guess you'll be able to relate to it yourself. Uh, again, but the long story short of it is, uh, if I'm expecting to measure uh, one cubic centimeter out of 100 cubic centimeters of a gas, but in reality, uh, 40 cubic centimeters of that gas are actually liquid, I'm really then only measuring one cubic centimeter out of 60 cubic centimeters. And if you do the math, one out of 100 is 0.1 and one out of 60 is, I don't know the math, but it's a bigger number than 0.1, uh, which gives us a false concentration. And that's really what this section uh, uh, speaks to. And here's the math in order to uh, prove that. And I'm not going to get into any examples. I don't believe I even ask you to do that. But you do have to understand uh, that having things in your sample that aren't supposed to be there are going to affect the uh, actual uh, concentration that you're measuring. OK, kilns here. Specific, uh, one quick tile here on kilns. Uh, due to the extremely high temperatures involved, these probes are usually, are, sorry, are actually cooled. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, sample is then sent to be conditioned in a heated line. So this is very interesting. Uh, specific application here with kilns having actually having cooled sensors, liquid cooled sensors. Um, so you send a hot sample uh, from the stack 
to the analyzer. Again, the reason that you send it there hot is because you don't want any of the things uh, condensing on the way because they condense in the lines and then you get your lines all plugged up. So they, uh, they send them heated there as such. There's lots of solids in there. Um, and then when they do cool them, those solids may build up at that, at that center point. And then what they have is what's called a blowback uh, system. And a blowback system is exactly what it sounds like. You have an air supply with a solenoid valve uh, going into the filter. And every so often that solenoid valve energizes capuche and it blows all the particles that are collected on the filter back into the system. And it might not be environmentally friendly, but it is uh, something that exists and is mentioned in the ILM. So that is, yes, that is the introduction or the first section of sample handling systems. Uh, again, the second ILM uh, contains a few new things in there, but there's actually quite a bit of where there was prior, uh, prior to the revision, uh, a lot of overlap uh, in, then in the second ILM, but uh, that, that's the first part. So, yeehaw. That is the end of part 